the timing is incredible because just as COVID was about to fade out, they find something else to uh, distract people's attention mm -hmm. from the reality. And the reality is, <coughs> if you look, we have now a rate of inflation depending on the household. You have a different household than I have and so forth. But say between 6 and 12 percent. Some people will say prices are going up by 12 percent and others will say by 5 percent and so forth. But somewhere in that range. And the Fed, the Central Bank of the United States, is discussing whether they want to increase interest rates by a quarter of a percent or half a percent. They are mad. <laughs> these, these guys are deranged. Yeah. The last time inflation was as high as it is now was in the 70s. And at the time, the Fed fund rate was over 8%. The, the people at the Fed are like a childish group of people playing in a sandbox. <laughs> they have no clue. Yeah. Or they are deliberately dishonest about the reality of the situation. Now, in my view, they were looking for an excuse somewhere up in the government. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure the president, I'm not sure the Fed, I'm not sure the Treasury Department, or all together at the same time. But they were kind of looking for an excuse. How can we explain to the public a high rate of inflation? What is better than to find a war? Because mm -hmm. of this evil Putin, we yeah. have inflation. Putin has very little to do with inflation, but he reinforced the trend because they embargoed him and they uh, imposed all kinds of restrictions. <laughs> so the prices <laughs> went up. But you understand, in my view, it's very suspect that we have this nine, that we have uh, this COVID 2020 at the time when the Fed had started to ease monetary policies six months earlier in August uh, 2019. Mm -hmm. But it didn't help much economically. We were in a weak spot in the economy. So then they have COVID. COVID was very bad for small business people and very good for big business people. <laughs> yes, it's true. You look, say, at the natural gas or oil market. Once oil is in a tank, it's very difficult to determine whether it came from Russia or whether it came from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So it's still in the marketplace. Obviously, because of the ban uh, on Russia and its bank to use the SWIFT system, they may be, there could be disruptions. I don't think the disruptions will be as bad as Westerners think, but there could be. You have to see one thing clearly. Everybody says, oh, Putin, he miscalculated and so forth. Uh, I think that he miscalculated in the uniform response of Western governments. That is, uh, that is a fact mm -hmm. that his actions have kind of reunited the NATO. Mm -hmm. Because NATO is not a very strong organization, but his threat has kind of put them together and so forth. And we all don't know what goes on behind the scenes and how much money is being transferred. We also don't know how much money Zelensky receives from the US, from Israel, from other countries and so forth. We, we don't know. But in general, I would say with each dollar increase in the price of oil, uh, Russia stands quite okay. The pay, what I think is interesting in this whole situation, if you look at it, the paper currency, the ruble has collapsed, okay? Mm -hmm. That we all agree. We can all see it on Bloomberg and on other uh, currency tables. But is the ruble that important for Russia or is the other currency, which is crude oil, and natural gas and wheat more important. I am not so sure uh, the countries will be able to really enforce 
this expropriation of individuals. Well, first of all, I don't think they can take half the reserves away because the dollar holdings in Russian reserves have declined from approximately 50% a few years ago to now only about 5%. Okay. So, and number two, the major reserves are in gold of yeah. the Russian uh, foreign exchange reserves. And I don't think that the Russians would be this stupid <laughs> to leave the gold in an American bank mm -hmm. or at the Fed. So I don't think they will lose all the foreign exchange reserves. But of course, I agree that they lost a ton of money, A, because the stock market has collapsed, and B, because uh, the currency has collapsed. Now, the thing is this, with the stock market collapse, when you think through it, say BP uh, and also Total, they have holdings in Russia. In the case of BP, British Petroleum, they own, I think, 12 or 20 percent of Rosneft. And they said they want to sell it. OK, uh, I think it would be a very interesting proposition, A, for the Russian central bank, for the Russian government, to buy that stake back at a very deep, distressed level. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. Number two, <coughs> it would be a great idea for China to go to, to Russia and say, look, you have all these assets that are being sold. We are interested to buy them because they could get the reserves mm -hmm. at very low cost. That's, that's true. So, so it, exactly how the whole situation will play out, nobody knows for sure. We just don't know. And also tomorrow there could be a ceasefire. I don't think there will be because I think once the American decided we get Putin to walk into so-called trap or to start the war, they won't settle for anything uh, that suits Putin mm -hmm. uh, right away. You understand? They basically, the aggression is to get Putin out of the way. And Putin, he will not go out of the way, but it's possible that someone in the Kremlin or in Russia knocks him off. Well, as I always said, uh, if you look at central banks and if you look at the character at the characters who are at central banks and fix the policy decisions and so forth, uh, I think it would be hard to have any confidence in any of these characters. So my view would be you have to be your own central bank. And I don't think that right now is the best moment to buy gold. But I think this situation has shown once again on the eruption of the conflict, stock markets got hit. They got hit, hit everywhere. In some places more, in some places less. But they got hit. And also Bitcoin got hit. And in my view, precious metals offered some stability. Of course, they're also volatile and sometimes they move up $20 and sometimes they move down $20. But in general, they've fulfilled their position mm -hmm. of being stable. <coughs> now, uh, there are other commodities that have gone up much more. Wheat is up like 50% in two months. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that, and the Fed sits there and says it's transitory. <laughs> I mean, it's unbelievable, unbelievable. You know, my advice is, I don't think the time is ideal to buy gold here, but I've been buying gold for the last 30, 40 years, every month a little bit. And so, and occasionally I increase the position meaningfully, but I never sold anything at all. These are my reserves because I do not trust governments. Yeah. But I have to also say, I don't trust exactly or precisely the custody of my gold, you understand, I have in a safe deposit box with banks. Mm -hmm. If they could seize uh, the properties of the oligarchs, and uh, if they could lock you down, 
they can also one day say, well, we'll take your gold away. They can mm. also say, we take your Bitcoins away. You understand? They can do a lot mm -hmm. of nasty things. <laughs> I would also say, you understand, not everybody has that good fortune. But I feel reasonably comfortable with having uh, real estate in the countryside. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, outside big cities, uh, next to a river, ideally, so you have water. But not, not next to a bridge, because there are many movies about war times and bridges. The tanks have to cross the bridge. <laughs> and uh, if you have a house next to the bridge, I can tell you the house is gone. <laughs> but a house far away from socialists, but in the countryside, is not a good investment as an investment, but it's a safe thing to have in uh, difficult times. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not sure if you live in New York City or in Hong Kong or in Tokyo or in uh, London, in a difficult situation, the food may not get into the city. The last thing I wanted to say, I always argued for diversification. I think it may not be a bad idea to have some assets uh, in Latin America mm -hmm. and maybe some assets in Asia. The Singapore Stock Exchange and the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, especially Hong Kong, is very, very inexpensive at the present time. Mm -hmm. Because we've been going down since 2015. We're no higher than, say, in 2006. And uh, the property companies are at half book value. Mm -hmm. Now, the property price may go down. But this is the reason I emphasized at the beginning, the Fed they cannot increase interest rates a lot, cannot. In Europe, it's the same. The, all the governments are bankrupt if interest rates go up a lot. Yeah. So my sense is that actually inflation will accelerate. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn $500,000, million, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke. And you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where to start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them and if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange and one of the biggest are for example Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well established exchanges but, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon, so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.